what we're going to do today is uh, we'll you know review what we talked about on, on Wednesday, and then we'll uh, press on into mechanics, and then we'll talk about why you know we we have to to be familiar. We don't really have to know all this. So on Wednesday, what we talked about was Brooks tooth, or we talked about discovery of X-rays. We talked about uh, um, how it it uh, happened. That was a lot of different people were uh, trying to experiment and try to figure out what electricity was. So they were experimenting with uh, cathode rays in a, a Crookes tube and trying to, you know, understand the properties of, of uh, electric flow through a, a partially vacuum tube. So it was behavior of electrons and it was quite by accident that he discovered them. Um, and it's quite likely that somebody else had, had noticed them, but they just didn't care enough to, to study them. But what he did was he, he put a, a uh, made the conditions where no light would escape from his Crookes tube, energized Crookes tube, and he saw the plate across the room glowing because it had barium platino cyanide on it. And uh, the, that substance demonstrated uh, what we call fluorescence or phosphorescence even. We'll, we'll talk about that later in the semester, but uh, it glows in response to a stimulus like fluorescent lights do. Um, so he, uh, he experimented with it for about two weeks and, and wrote everything that he observed, and that's a really foundation for what uh, we think we know about x-rays. So that was November 8, 1895. Uh, we talked about it uh, really was a, a dangerous thing at first. It's become less so to the point we we've, we've got to respect it. It's kind of like fire; we have to respect it. But uh, we don't need to be, you know, fearful of of the radiation. We just need to know how to protect ourselves. And we're going to hit that a little bit again because it's important that y'all understand. And the video y'all got was me in my office. So uh, you know, I, I think there's some visuals there that that are important to. Take home with So it's dangerous and need to make it less dangerous. It developed, you know, eventually it developed into CT, MAMO, of course, diagnostic, fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy being, the, did y'all get the videos where they were swallowing? Or did I post those? I didn't post those, so I'll post those. Okay, so fluoroscopy is moving x rays and then bone densitometry. All right, so it was really dangerous, and how we um, made it less dangerous was. I did get the video, I know the video, even in the, the PowerPoints I showed, showed the intensifying screens and maybe the exposure of ten, intensifying screens. Okay, so those took away a lot of the radiation dose. Uh, cut the dose down eventually, not right away, but eventually cut the radiation dose to about 1% of what it originally was. So it was very significant. Actually, eventually, uh, because these screens got so good with time, they cut it down even greater than that. So what they did was they used the intensifying screens, the intensifying screens intensified the, uh, the signal to the film. We used radi or radiographic film, which is really just photographic film on a special base. Um, and then uh, somebody else came along, you know, in a lot of cases development of, of something is somebody takes somebody else's idea and just expands on it. So what somebody else did was they took the film and instead of having the goo that puts the stuff on the film on one side, they put it on two sides and used two intensifying screens uh, to, to superimpose two images on top of each other, which effectively cut the dose down another half. Okay, so uh, that limited dose, that limited dose by enabling us to use a lower mass value um, you know, because most of the, the exposure was actually created by light. So along came Rollins. Rollins implemented uh, collimation filtration, and those limited dose by limiting how much uh, collimation or beam restriction, how much of the area the, of the patient we actually exposed to, to radiation. So dose went down from that, but he also implemented filtration, which removed low energy photons. It wouldn't do anything except for add the patient dose. So it made a better quality x-ray feed. Eventually, we, we developed better transformers, uh, better x-ray tubes, fully vacuum x-ray tubes. And we'll talk about the significance of that later in the semester. 
developed standards for exposure and for patient exposure. We want to keep the dose as low as reasonably achievable, and we call that ALARA. So we do that by exposing the patient to um, proper technique. You know, you don't want to overdose the patient um, by practicing collimation filtration, by um, limiting repeats, you know, um, not over collimating so that we have to repeat. So we keep the dose as low as reasonably achievable. Give the patient protective apparel like uh, shields where appropriate. Um, we protect the, the general public with, with barriers. And again, y'all aren't here Wednesday, so I'll tell you this. When you go to lab today, look at the door. Not the outer door, but the inner door. And what you'll see is um, at, if you look at the edge of the door, you know, you open the door and you got the width of the door, but the thickness of the door, what you'll see is a bulge in that fake wood, right? And what's in the middle of that bulge, you know, they try to hide it, but what's in the middle of that bulge is lead. So that whole room down there is lead lined so that x-rays can't get out of it. And, if, and that's the reason it's so heavy. But whenever you go to clinicals, every door that you see most likely is leaded. The glass that you look through, the window that you look through from the control panel is leaded glass. So uh, those are examples of barriers, of primary barriers or secondary barriers. Um, and that protects the general public. And then gonadal shielding is just the top shielding. So that's your patient um, protection. But we also have protection for you. And there are three rules for uh, occupational dose limitation. Those are spend as little time in the room as possible, stay as far away from the beam as possible, and um, shield yourself whenever you have to be in a room. So when you're in a room with a patient and with a radiologist or a, um, um, in a lot of cases it's gonna be a PA rather than a radiologist, Patient's on the table here, right? So patient's on the table. And if you're doing a fluoro case, anybody done a fluoro case? Y'all you know, now have two full days of clinicals behind you, huh? Have you seen anything fun? Yeah, but tell me, what, what have you seen? Chest x-rays. Chest x-rays. <laughs> you know why we start with chest x-rays, right? So yeah, that's, yeah, they get pretty mundane. But uh, anybody seen any, any kind of fractures or? Foreign bodies, or yeah, what'd you see? We walked in at 7 30 on our first day, and immediately before we even clocked in, there was trauma. Oh, and cool. that was the first thing we x rayed was the trauma, and we saw it before they got fixed up. Oh, yeah, was the trauma. Yeah, so what what they have? They Any? had lacerations to their arteries and their uh, oh. right arm, or oh, left, really? it was their left arm, wasn't it? I can't remember. It was Rock. the first day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rock. And right also, um, I can't remember. Any fractures? Yes, we x-rayed a finger yeah. that was fractured at the very tip. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He also had lacerations. And, yeah. yeah. Did you get a history? Find out what he did? Uh, no, mm -hmm. I think he, uh, that out. one just fell. And then the, the, the first day, he just cut himself with glass. And that was the lacerations. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have any fractures. But that was... First thing was trauma yeah. on our first day, 7.30, clocking in. Well, for a laceration, could, and they took x-rays of laceration. Mm -hmm. Probably glass. looking for glass, yeah. yeah. Any kind of foreign body. Okay, so um, whenever you do a fluoroscopy case, uh, you're get, you have to be in a room with a patient. You can't just, you know, tell a patient to get on the table and, and then, you know, you handle the procedure yourself. I'm, I'll be over here if you need, you know, you can't do that. Um, the... The mechanism that causes the x-ray tube to energize on a fluoro uh, case, uh, the x-ray tube is actually inside of the table in most of your fluoro units, um, they call it a bed man switch. And you gotta step on it to make it work. Okay, so you gotta be in the room. The patient can't lean off the table and hit it. You gotta be in the room. So what do you gotta do? Protect yourself. Protect yourself with? Shielding, a lead apron. Yeah, make sure you put on a lead apron. Yeah, you can put on a thyroid shield. They've got these little glasses that you can put on that are leaded glasses. Um, so you, they've even got these, anybody put on the gloves? Yeah, you've got no dexterity with these gloves. Um, they're real thick and they're leaded. And you know, I mean, you, you try to put those on, you 
try to work with the patient, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything. Um, but you you have to protect yourself. So lead apron is a minimum. Make sure you you wear your lead apron. But what we uh, you know what you tend to do is is try to show a little bit too much interest in what's going on in the room. You know, so you got the patient on the table here. So the patient's head is here. Uh, the PA is usually standing right there working the, the fluoro unit and you're assisting. You know, at that point, you're just, a, you're an assistant. So if you're doing a, a case where the patient has to drink some barium, you're giving the patient the barium and you're taking the barium away from the patient because they're gonna have the patient rolling around if they're on the table, they may be standing up, but they're gonna be moving around. And if they slosh that barium all over the image intensifier, that's the only thing that's gonna show up on the image. It's very dense. It's, it's much harder for x-rays to get through the barium than what it is to get through bone. So he or she will give the patient something to drink and then expect you to take it away from them, but to be right there to give it back to them. Okay, so the table's right here. All right, so patient's on the table. You give the patient, you're standing right here, you give the patient the, uh, the barium to drink. Do you have to stay right here? No. no, not at all. So what you can do is instead of staying right here, you can back up a little bit. Okay, so there's three rules. There's time, distance, distance and shielding. You can't really do anything about the time. In this case, you're in a floral case, you have to be in a room. But, I always feel bad when I'm trying to wipe the board off and I go right away to, to start marking it up. So, if let's say you've got a radiation, a, a, a radiation field that's that big, okay? And this is the middle of this thing, put a mark on it. So you can see exactly where the middle is. If I have my source to image distance, we call it SID, at that distance, that's probably, this thing's probably 48 inches long, so that's probably 24 inches, okay? So if I, my SID is 24 inches and I project a field that big, if I were to back my source up, instead of being at, you know, that distance, if my source was now this far out, how big, and I didn't change anything else, how big of a projected area, I double my distance, how big of a projected area would you suspect that I would have? Larger. Larger, right? It'd be larger. So if I had a flashlight right here and I projected a, a light field there and I backed it up by a factor of two, you would expect it to grow by how much? Two. No. Yeah, you would think so. And in a way, you're right. It grows by a factor of two, but it grows by a factor of two in two dimensions, which means that it spreads out over an area four times as large, okay? So what that means is all the radiation that was striking here is spread out over a much larger area, which means this particular chunk right here receives how much proportionally after we back up than how much it, it receives before. One fourth, exactly. So you took all that intensity, all that radiation, you spread it out over a larger area, it receives one fourth. Now, if you limit the field size to the original field size, what happened to your patient dose? Has it increased four times? No, no, no. This is after you backed up. Okay. It decreased by a factor of four, right? That's what we call an inverse square law. Inverse square law states that changes in intensity decrease, this is way deeper in the, in the chapter, it probably is not in your notes, and you don't necessarily have to know this, this is just, you need to know this, but not for the test. You need to know this for practical purposes. Inverse square law says that with an increase in, in distance from a radiation source, the intensity striking the image receptor, striking the, the receiver, the patient, or you, will decrease by a factor of four. Okay, so let's go back to our patient. You're right up against the patient, okay? And let's say from the patient, all of your dose is gonna come off of scatter radiation, okay? So you're right up on the patient and, and you're receiving all this scatter radiation. Let's say the patient is here and it's a foot away, the patient's a foot away, 
right? So you get one foot from your patient, which becomes the source, to you, which is kind of like the image receptor. You know, your dose is specific to that one foot. What happens if you take one step back, now you're two feet away? How much radiation dose are you gonna get now? If your original dose was 10, we'll say MR, what is it at two feet? It reduces by a factor of? Four. Four, exactly. So your dose, with that one step back, goes from 10 to, divide that by four, 2.5, okay? So you can't do anything about the time, but you can do something about the shielding, you can put on an apron, you can do something about the distance, you can step back, right? So what if instead of taking a little step back, you took a big step back? Even lower. It's gonna be even lower, right? So if you not only took a, a little bit bigger a step back, but you just kind of snuck over behind the PA or the, the radiologist, now what's your dose? Probably nothing, okay? So time, spend as little time as possible. There's gonna be times that you cannot get out of the room and you're gonna get a radiation dose. But anytime that happens, if, if, you're, um, if you're using, you know, if you're shooting uh, portable x-rays, you gotta be up on the floor. But what should you be wearing all the time? Blood apron. Blood apron, right. Anytime you make an x-ray, I mean, between patients, you don't necessarily have to. Um, but you got, you know, shielding that you can use. And step back, you'll see, you'll see text. You know, the patient's sitting in a wheelchair, or sitting bedside. They put the image receptor right behind the patient, and then they stand right here and say, "Okay, hold your breath." Do you have to be right here? No. No. Actually, I didn't even say this on on Wednesday, but you've got mobile shielding with you much better than, than what we have in a shielded room uh, whenever you do portables, okay? So I, I mentioned that um, the source of electrons in a, in a portable x-ray unit is from batteries, right? What are batteries made of? You ever pick one up? I don't, I don't mean a D-cell battery, but I mean a, a car battery? Uh, plastic. The outer portion is plastic, but they weigh a ton because they're full of fluid and they're full of lead. Okay, so what what is your shielding? Lead, Lead right. So you get behind the, the X-ray unit if you're doing portables. you not nothing's coming through that X-ray unit. You know, I mean, if it's only about that tall, well, you're getting blasted up here. But if you're shooting a KUV on a really really big patient, it's going to require a lot of radiation. What if you squat down behind that, the portable unit? You going to get hit? Probably not. Uh, so, shielding, time distance shielding, that's your radiation protection. Okay, so any questions on all that? Nope. Okay, what we're going to talk about um, are, is mechanics and, and physics, basic physics. And we're going to talk about how it is that, that we're going to use each one of these measures in imaging. Uh, even if it doesn't really seem like we're going to, we are. So, um, for scientific reproducibility and, and measurement, we have to have something that's recognizable uh, worldwide, pretty much. You know, any scientist can uh, relate to. There's only a couple of, of countries on the planet that still use feet and yards and miles, and we're one of them, which I don't have a problem with. But, uh, you know, for the rest of the world, you know, they're, they're using meters and kilometers and, and uh, kilograms and things like that. So, uh, most of your, your scientific journals or scientific papers or experimentation is going to be uh, based off of what we call SI units. So, um, standard units measurements that we're going to talk about are going to be length, mass, and time. Length is not going to be the foot, it's not going to be the yard. It's going to be a, a, a meter. And a meter is, uh, you know, it was originally, they had this bar of, of uh, um, metal 
at a inside of a safe somewhere in France that they used with they had two marks on it. And they said, okay, this is a meter. That's standard unit of meter. Um, platinum uridium, I think it was. Um, and they decided that, that they needed something different. So they based it on a wavelength of light that uh, is emitted from an isotope of krypton. So we've touched on this, light travels in waves, okay? And a wave distinguishes electromagnetic radiation um, in energy levels, okay? So you can have wavelengths like this, you can have wavelengths that are really, really short, X-rays and gamma rays, and you have wavelengths that are extremely long. Uh, wavelength may be as long as both of these boards put together. Okay, so radio waves all the way up to X-ray, and then we've got this light from the, the krypton, which is one wavelength long, which is one meter, and a wavelength is from the same spot on two waves, two adjacent waves. Okay, so that's what we base it on now. Originally, mass was uh, you know this kilogram. And we've established that the mass and weight are not the same thing, but uh, mass originally was uh, water, cool water, uh, 1,000 cubic centimeters of water kept at 4 degrees Celsius. And then time is based on the vibration of, of cesium atoms. So what we have to have in order to make measurements relatable are two things. What we just talked about were units. Okay, so a unit is what we have. A unit is, is the second of a meter or the um, uh, kilogram. But we have to have a quantity as well. Okay, so a quantity just tells you how many units you have. And you can't have one without the other. You know, somebody says, how far is that door away from you? And I'd say somewhere around 50. 50 what? You know, 50 feet, 50 yards. You know, if, if somebody's not here looking at it, there's no perspective there. So you have to have both the unit and the magnitude, the magnitude being how many of something you have, okay? So each one of these uh, things that we're gonna talk about has both of those. So we're gonna be talking primarily about derived units, which is a combination of different uh, units, one, one unit, multiple times for uh, multiple units. So, we're gonna run through these. Let's say velocity. What is velocity? What's that? Yeah, that's, that's a formula for it, but what is it? Uh, there we go. Measure how fast something is moving. Yeah, measure how fast something's moving. So, what do we call that? Speed, exactly. It's speed. Acceleration we'll get to in a minute. But speed is, is a measure of how, it's, it's like how fast something is moving right now. So velocity is speed. And it is calculated, you use it all the time. You know, you drive from here to Flint or whatever. Um, what's that sign that hangs on the side of the wall? Or the side of the wall, side of the road? Speed, speed. speed limit, right. So speed limit is velocity, speed limit. And it's a measure of distance over time. Okay, so velocity is equal to distance over time. It's a measure of speed, how fast something is going. Now, if you wanted to average your velocity, average velocity, that would be, you, you would have, first off, have to calculate two different velocities. How do you take the average of anything? At the end of the semester, you want to know what your grade is. How do you take your average? Yeah. Add all values together and divide by the number of values. Well, in this case, we're just looking at two. So we've got two velocities. We've got original velocity plus ending velocity or terminal velocity. And we're going to divide that in this case because we've got two values just by two, right? So average velocity is just like finding the average of anything else. Now we take a little bit of a break from that and we talk about Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, 
you know, his observations uh, and what led him to form his uh, three laws were based on, uh, you know, his observations in the 16th century. So he came up with three laws, uh, aside from, you know, gravity, theory of gravity. The uh, first one being inertia. Now, we'll read through the, the definitions there. A body will remain at rest or will continue to move with constant velocity in a straight line unless acted on by external force. What does that mean? It's kind of like in space, you know, things are going to just keep going at the same velocity. Indefinitely. There's no friction or anything. Right. Stopping. Now imagine this guy in the 16th century, centuries before space travel, figuring this out. All right, so what that means is body in motion stays in motion, body at rest stays at rest. You've heard it a thousand times, right? So I throw this pen across the room. Is it going to keep going forever? Because this says that, that a body will remain in motion unless it's acted on by external force that would change it or stop it. Gravity will pull it down. You got gravity, right? We'll test that. Okay. Friction. Exactly. We've got friction. It's rolling across the floor. Even if I didn't have this floor, let's say the Earth was not a solid planet. Let's say it was a gas planet. Would it continue to go forever? No. No. How do we know that? You got gas in the atmosphere. Exactly. Now, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit and talk about gravity. Uh, gravity we talked about it on Wednesday as well, back camera. Uh, but gravity is both a theory and a law. Um, here on planet Earth, we know exactly how much uh, acceleration or how much speed or how much of a change in, in velocity, change in speed we're gonna have um, based on the gravitational pull of the Earth. And if you jump out of an airplane, you're gonna fall at a constant rate and that is uh, 9.6 meters per second squared, okay? So you jump out of an airplane, you climb up to 10,000 feet and you jump out of an airplane, you're gonna, you're gonna fall at a constant rate, but are you gonna continue to accelerate indefinitely? Not indefinitely. I think that you, you just kind of stay at the same speed. Eventually, you're going to get to what we call terminal velocity, and that's kind of what we're talking about oh, here, terminal velocity. All right, you're going to get to terminal velocity, which is somewhere around 220 miles an hour. Now, um, there's a guy, and you can look this guy up on YouTube, um, and he, he wanted to uh, break the record for the fastest free fall in history. Oh. Man. So he got in one of those specialized balloons full of helium and it looks like a space suit. Have you seen these things? They, they're, you know, 100 feet tall and they're really oblong and they're... Uh, like suborbital. Yeah, and he gets in this thing and he goes up to like 120,000 feet, right to the edge of space. And he's got on a special suit with oxygen because the air is so thin up... Man, I just gave that away. The air is so thin up there that there is no oxygen. So he. You know, he's, he's got this thing on it. Basically, we're in a space chute. And he's got oxygen. He opens the door. He steps out. And he falls. Okay? So, what's the speed of sound? Anybody know? Uh, my, what, what is it like? Yeah, it's Mach 1. Yeah, it's Mach 1. Uh, so, the speed of sound is right around 750 miles an hour. Okay? So, how does sound work? We're, we're taking a lot of different trails and we're going to come back. How does sound work? What's it based on? Vibrations. Vibration of? Uh, hmm? Waves. Molecules. So if we were in the vacuum of space right now, I could talk all day, you wouldn't hear me because there are no molecules to get to you. So here's another rapid trail. How is it that um, astronauts can talk to each other. Radios. Radios, yeah, but radios work off of, radio, of uh, ra radio, you know, radio, radio waves, waves, which are electromagnetic wow. energy, but how does how does the, the microphone pick it up? They 
inside the little thingy, isn't it? Inside the little thingy. That's but what thing. what do they have to have inside the little thingy so they don't die? Oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah. Right. So they create a false atmosphere inside of there. There's molecules, so they can talk. The the vibration of the molecules makes it to the to the microphone. The microphone picks it up, puts it into a radio wave, sends it all the way to Houston, right? So we got all that, right? So this guy, <coughs> he gets um, outside of the uh, the balloon and he starts to fall, and he accelerates to about 650 miles an hour. And if you look up a video on this, he breaks the sound barrier. Wait a minute. Didn't I just say the speed of sound is 750 miles an hour? How did that happen? Well, how does sound work? Because there was less atmosphere. There's less atmosphere. Okay, so the speed of sound at his altitude was actually lower. And if you listen, if you've got good enough speakers, you can turn it up real loud. This guy in a space suit falling through the atmosphere, you can hear just a little, he breaks the sound barrier, okay, in a free fall. So he accomplished his goal. He was the fastest person ever to fall. Did he pass out? He did. He passed out, and he went, he went into a flat spin, and that's what caused him to pass out. Right. And uh, his family thought he was dead. You know, I mean, he accomplished his goal, but you know, he's gonna bounce when he hits the ground. Uh, but he came to, he came to, he, you know, flat span kind of straightened itself out, and he came to, and he pulled a ripcord, and, and he was, he was fine. He floated to the earth. Now imagine you're falling at 650 miles an hour, and you pull a ripcord that's just going, you know, going under your arms and between your legs. What would happen to you? Break your arm. Probably tear you in half. Probably tear you in half. Okay? So how did he not have that happen though? He, he's alive today as far as I know. Did he do like a whole bunch of mini parachutes before? No, just uh, not as far as I know. You know, he probably had the, the one parachute to pull out the main parachute, but uh, just one parachute. Okay. Did how did he get up to that fast? What did he not have? that he would have down here. Well, he's, well, that's one thing. That's one thing. The reason he got up this fast was for the same reason that speed or the speed of sound is, is uh, higher here than it is up there. And that is that we've got atmosphere here. So terminal velocity, the closer he got to the earth, the more he slowed down until he got to the, in the atmosphere terminal velocity of about 220 miles an hour. He flattened himself out. That's if you're just falling straight down. He flattened himself out, probably slowed down to about 120 miles an hour, pulled the, the uh, ripcord, floated safely to the ground. After a okay. uh, Yeah, it was like a five minute free fall. So uh, it took a long time to, to get all the way down. All right, so <clears throat> going back to uh, Newton's laws, uh, that just introduction to weight, uh, force. So we got we got uh, inertia change. Uh, yeah, we, we're not done with inertia. Resistance to change. So we're going back to space. So Newton, being a genius he was, looked at the planets moving and uh, realized that there's not a whole lot that, that makes a change in the movement of those planets. So he hypothesized that if you could put something like let's say a cannon on a a uh, mountaintop and shoot it, if you shot it, because of everything that we just talked about, gravity and atmosphere, cannonballs eventually come to the earth, right? But if your mountain was high enough and your cannon was powerful enough to escape the, the earth's gravitational pull, it would go into orbit and never stop. Okay, so body in motion remains in motion unless acted on by external force. Uh, external force here is gravitational pull, atmosphere, but if you get outside of gravitational pull and atmosphere, the earth will go forever. Okay. So, in a vacuum of space, um, <clears throat> inertia is, you know, uh, resistance to change, absolute. So, um, everything on the earth, though, has inertia. Everything possesses inertia. If something's in motion, uh, it takes a little bit of 
to work to of work to stop it. If something is is at rest, you know, even though this is very light and it's got wheels, it takes something to push it, right? It resists. So we go to Newton. We have inertia, resistance, it, resistance, resistance to change. And then uh, second law, we have uh, force. The force that acts on an object is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration it produced. Okay. So the force of you know, this chair going across the room is equal to the mass of the chair plus the, um, you know, how fast it's going. Okay, so not earth breaking there. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And then finally, we get to uh, Newton's third law for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when I push this chair, when I push it and make it go, what that says is that because of inertia, it's resisting change. When I push, the chair is pushing against me as hard as I'm pushing against the chair. And you got to do a little bit of, you know, mental gymnastics here. The chair is static. It's not doing anything. So the the push against me um, is is not active. Okay. But at the point where I'm pushing on this chair, the force in between our hand, my hand and the chair is equal. Does that make sense? And in that way, it's pushing against me as hard as I'm pushing against it. Okay. So, uh, action, action, excuse me, action, reaction is third. All right, everybody with me so far? So weight we already talked about pretty pretty much as, as much as we're gonna talk about. It is uh, acceleration of gravity or the gravitational effects on mass. Measured most accurately in pounds or newtons or um, stone or something like that. So momentum, when you say something has momentum, uh, what, what do you mean? The mass of an object in motion, right? So, again, you know, if, if I push this chair, how hard is it to stop? Not very hard, right? If I push that chair really, really hard, how much harder would it be to stop? Significantly more. If I set somebody in the chair and pushed it, now what do I have? Drag. <laughs> you got drag, but if I push it just as fast, how would it, how hard would it be for somebody to stop it? If, if somebody big was in it and I pushed it just as hard, oh, yeah, it'd be hard. So it's a difference between trying to stop a toddler on a little tyke's plastic car versus stopping a car that's coming at you, right? So momentum is a uh, product of, of mass and velocity. All right, now let's go back to velocity. So we have velocity. Velocity is just speed. We talk about average velocity. We also have acceleration. So what's the pedal on the right hand side of your car? What do we call that? Acceleration. Accelerate. Right. You step on that, what does your car do? Accelerate. Drive me nuts. It accelerates. It takes off. So acceleration, when you accelerate, uh, what what's going on there? What do you have a change in? Is your is your velocity remaining the same? No, you're speeding up, right? You're speeding up. So acceleration is speeding up. That is a change, we'll say change in acceleration, or change in velocity. So you go from a start to 10 miles an hour, you accelerate at 10 miles an hour. If you go from a, uh, you know, you're trying to get around a tractor on one of those farm market roads in town, or outside of town, that's, uh, Acceleration. So, how do we calculate acceleration? In ending velocity, or final velocity, or terminal velocity, 
minus our original velocity over the time it took to go from one to the other, this change of velocity, okay? So in order to calculate our acceleration or our average velocity, what do we have to, to calculate first? Just velocity, right? So we've, we've got to have velocity. So when we got it to acceleration, we've got uh, distance over time minus distance over time divided by time, right? So these things are compounding, right? All right, so that's acceleration, and we get to momentum. Again, we have to, to calculate uh, um, velocity. So work. <clears throat> work is the product of force and distance. Okay, so force, how do we calculate force? Force is equal to? Uh, mass times, force. Mass times acceleration. acceleration, right? So force is equal to mass times acceleration. Now we go back over to work. And work is uh, what you're going to do with the force in the distance that you're going to, to do the work. Right? And some things just don't look like work, but they are um, by definition. Power then becomes uh, work over time, done over time, which is just force times distance over time. In a lot, a lot of cases, we're going to measure uh, power, electrical power, in wattage. It's right there on the light bulb. So, you know, you, you might not be thinking of a light bulb as, as actually doing work, but it does. It does, does work for you. So the, the wattage is the measure of power in, in the light bulb. So the higher the wattage, the brighter the light bulb. Right? Okay, so we've talked about energy. We've got kinetic energy. We've got uh, um, potential energy. So we're just going to plug those in here too. Potential energy and kinetic energy. And that is the introduction into how it is that we're going to use all this. Where do we use potential energy? Where do we have potential energy in the X-ray system? Okay, so what you've got is you get a collection of electrons, right? A collection of electrons around the filament where you make an X-ray. When you, you, you push the prep button, you push the prep button, and what happens when you push the prep button? The rotor spins up, right? So you've got uh, potential energy. Are you creating X-rays yet? No. no, you're not. You don't create X-rays until you apply, you press the, the uh, exposure button, you apply what? Heat. Okay, you created heat, but it, they don't travel across the tube. You've got low voltage, maybe 10 to 15 volts. They don't travel across the tube until you apply. Mm -hmm. You create kinetic energy, KVP. So you apply, you, you change the potential difference between the cathode and the anode into the x-ray tube instead of 10 to 15 volts applied here you're going to have more like uh, 100,000 volts, right? Now the electrons go across the tube, okay? So what do they become now? Kinetic, Kinetic energy, right. So what did we do? Where they, tra they were traveling this way, but were they traveling across the tube at all before we hit the exposure button? So our velocity was what? Nothing, Nothing. right. Once we hit it with KVP, did we change that velocity? Did we have x-rays, or not x-rays, but electrons going across the tube? Yes. yes. So we accelerated, where, there it is, accelerated the electrons across the tube. Our velocity was zero, so our velocity is dependent on our KVP, okay? If we apply 50 KVP, they may go across the tube at somewhere around one-fourth of the speed of light. These are electrons, okay? These are not X-ray photons. X-ray photons all travel at the same speed, and that is speed of light, right? So these are electrons, and at 50 kbp, they may be traveling across the tube at a quarter of the speed of light. Bless you. 
At 100 kbp, they may be going across the tube at one third to one half the speed of light. Okay? So they went from zero to a quarter of the speed of light, or from zero to, uh, you know, as, as close to half of the speed of light. So we accelerated the electrons to a, a specific velocity as they, as they went across the tube. Okay? Now, what's the purpose for accelerating the electrons specifically to those values? I'm glad you asked. Because of inertia, because of action reaction, because of momentum, what we're going to do, what we're hoping to do, is do one of two things. You got a nucleus of an atom, right? Making sure I'm on the camera, I'll move over a little bit. We got a nucleus of the atom. What if one of these electrons gets close to the nucleus of the atom? What do we get? Hmm? A negative charge? Okay, they are a negative charge. Okay, so we still got electrons. We haven't created x-rays yet. If it gets close enough to the nucleus of the atom, then we've got positive charges here, and we eh, won't give it a zero. We'll give it a neutral. If it gets close enough to the nucleus of the atom, the nucleus of the atom grabs it and sends it in a different direction. We lose momentum because we lose velocity, so we lose kinetic energy, but do we? Well, no, not according to the law of uh, conservation of energy, so where does that energy go? If it came in with 100 kbp worth of energy and it leaves with 1 kbp worth of energy, what happens to that other 99? It's radio wave. Uh, X-ray wave. X-ray wave. So we've got an x-ray photon created off of that. Remember, squiggly line means x-ray, straight line means uh, electron. electron. Right. So we lost momentum, and the result was that we got an x-ray photon. So what do we call that? Brims. 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 There we go. Brims x-ray creation. If it hits one of these outer shell electrons and knocks it out, then what's going to happen? You get a vacancy there. Uh, is Adam happy with that? No. The answer is no. So what's it going to do? It's going to grab one and it's going to sl slip the, uh, an electron from an outer shell down into that shell. And um, what are we going to create there? Characteristic. Characteristic. Right. So we'll get a characteristic X-ray photon off of that. Characteristic photons are generally in the 69.5 kbp range. Is characteristic of the tungsten atom. Now, what did we have to have in order to knock that out? Okay, I hope this doesn't backfire. Actually, I'm gonna change this a little bit. There we go. Okay, I take a pen. Why did the chair not move? You didn't have enough force, you didn't have enough momentum, right? So, I broke it. I don't suppose that, but well, just it's an insignificant part. If I don't have enough momentum because I don't have enough velocity in my projectile electrons to knock this out, then what's going to happen? It's just going to bounce off. Right. So, I have to accelerate the electrons across the tube to have enough velocity so that we have enough momentum enough force carrying with it to knock it out, right? So I knock the thing out, and the reaction is we create a triple time. Okay? You got it? You understand why all that matters? It's interesting. So, um, again, don't spend all weekend trying to memorize how to, to work these things. Just know how to pick them out of a description. You know, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a question that says something like change in uh, velocity. What 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 mathematical formula, you know, it, uh, tells you what the change in velocity is? What would that be? Acceleration, right? So I'll be able to pick it out, uh, but don't uh, don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to work. All right. Questions on all that. Okay, then 
uh, you know where we use kinetic energy or where we get kinetic energy, you know what potential energy is. Uh, again, KVP is, is going to be our measure of, of potential energy, and the higher the KVP, the higher the kinetic energy of the electrons, the higher the kinetic energy of the electrons, the higher the energy of x rating. But remember, acceleration of electrons, photons are all the same speed, being speed line. So, uh, what's the main thing we create in the tube? Heat. heat, right. So, heat, uh, unfortunately, is the main thing we create, and it's the main thing that's going to destroy the tube. The only, really, the only other thing that might destroy the tube, and that uh, the x ray tubes and the systems now are built in such a way that um, they're probably less likely to, to die from rough handling. You know, back, back when I was still in practice, uh, you know, people just walk in, they hit all the buttons and, and just pull. And, you know, I mean, you, you'd be moving along at about two miles an hour and the, the detents would click in and just lock the tube in place. You could just slam tubes around. Now, you know, you, you've pretty much got to be looking at the ceiling and you've got to be moving real slow to get them just in the precise area, you know. So, probably less rough handling. Uh, damage in the tubes now than, than what there was, you know, 20 years ago. But that would be the next most likely thing, um, and it's pretty rare. So heat is the number one thing. We create it, we don't like it, we wish we didn't create it, we wish we had a different way of creating x-rays without heat, but we, we don't, so we create heat. So since we create heat, we got to deal with it. We're going to deal with it in three different ways, okay? So we've got conduction, convection, and thermal radiation. Okay, so we've got an x-ray tube. And again, uh, the metal thing that you see is not the x-ray tube, that is the tube housing. So inside of the tube housing, you got an x-ray tube that looks a lot like you know, what have passed around. So you've got that. So in that thing, you've got a rotor that rotates, and you've got a, a, uh, a filament. So you've got a cathode. Cathode is the source of electrons, so it's negative. And the anode is the thing that spins, and it is the positive end of the x-ray tube. So when you apply KVP, what you're doing really fundamentally is you're changing the potential difference the electric potential so effectively what you're doing is you're saying okay we're going to make this like really really positive and this really 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 negative opposites do what attract. attract right so it becomes more attractive for the electrons to travel across the tube so what happens whenever you run her up is you get a collection of electrons here and we've got words for those again on Wednesday, and I don't know if I put that in the in the other video, but we call that thermionic emissions. Okay, all right. So let's break it down. What is an ion? Charged particle. Charged particle. That's all it is. Charged particle. So uh, an ion is a charged particle. When we create X-rays, it is. Um, ionizing radiation. It's ionizing radiation because it's in energy range high enough that it can eject an orbital electron thereby making an ion pair. Okay, so it's therm ionic emission. So we got ions. What is an electron? Fundamentally, it is a it's a negative charge, which is a charged particle, so it's not. Right? So what does this sound like? Heat. Heat. Right. So what we got is thermionic emissions. That's emission of hot ions on the cathode. That's all it is. We've we got hot electrons. We create a space charge, sometimes referred to as an electron cloud. But for this uh, explanation, thermionic emissions is the best explanation we've got. We've got hot ions. So if we've got hot ions right there, What's going to happen to the x-ray tube? What's happening right here? It gets hot, just like a light bulb. you got an incandescent light bulb, eventually it burns out because 
you wear out your filament and it, it just burns out. You melt through it, okay? Suppose that could happen on x-ray tube. Sure. If it can happen on a light bulb, an x-ray tube is just a big, expensive, and complicated light bulb, yes, okay? So, are the hot ions, or the heat from the ions just gonna be right there? Anybody ever been camping? No. Done, no? <laughs> a couple of you know. Okay, you ever pulled anything off of the stove top, um, and let's say it was a little bit too close to the heat, and it burned your hand, reached inside the oven, and got a burned hand. How does that heat get from the heating element? Okay, you pull your toast out of the toaster. As soon as it pops up, what does it feel like? Hot. 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 Right. Hot. Was it touching the filament? No. Probably not. It's, you know, it's got that little grate that sandwiches it in there and it keeps it away. How did it get hot? Close. How about the hot came off of the filament and just baked it, right? What is radiation? Uh, yeah, we'll get there in a second. It's transference of energy through space, right? What's the space in your toaster? It's that distance between the filament and your bread. So it radiates to the bread and it cooks it. It radiates specifically heat, right? So thermal radiation, radiation spreads out. So we're gonna get thermal radiation. Now does, does uh, radiation, does, does heat require molecules? We said sound requires molecules. Does heat require molecules? How do we know that? Uh, we get heat from the sun. Bingo! And the sun is where? In space. In a vacuum of space. But the heat still gets here, right? So we don't necessarily need molecules, right? It's a vacuum tube. No longer use partially vacuum tube. It's a vacuum tube. So um, the heat's going to spread out. And as a matter of fact, heat is going to spread out more efficiently in a vacuum than what it is, you know, in, in an atmosphere. So, is all the heat going to stay here? No. The answer is no. Where is the heat going to be concentrated? Here. But where is it going to go? It's going to radiate everywhere. Okay? Okay? So, uh, convection. Okay? So, we've got to deal with this. And we'll get there here in a second. Uh, convection. What is convection? you got a convection oven. Uh, what does it do? It blows heat. It blows air, right? So you got inside your oven, you got molecules because, you know, it's not a vacuum oven. Um, and uh, if you hit the convection thing on it, what it does is it circulates the air so it cooks more even. Okay, so convection is circulation is all it is. And then we've got conduction. Now, conduction is spreading by touching, okay? So spreading by radiation, spreading by circulation, conduction is spreading by touching. So that doesn't really apply so much on this end of the x-ray tube, but when we make the exposure and the electrons jump across the tube, then um, is all the heat gonna be right here? No. No, where's it gonna go? It's gonna go down the anode. It's gonna go down the anode, and that's bad news there because what's gonna happen, it rotates, and it's gonna rotate on ball bearings. All right. Okay, so you got bearings in there. Have you ever pulled up to a stoplight and there's a car that pulls up next to you and it's just making this horrific grinding sound as it pulls up next to you? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, one of those ball bearings is out. Right, you got uh, bearings that eventually wear out, right? And if they get hot, then they wear out a whole lot quicker. So we'll want to keep the heat away from these bearings as much as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to conduct it. Okay, so the heat doesn't stay right there. If the, if the anode was stationary, it would still spread out, but it's not going to spread out as efficient. Okay, if you remember the, um, the, the anode that I passed around, what you saw were little bitty hash marks in it. And that's where we had uh, high exposures throughout the anode. Okay, so what we're going to do, how we're going to deal with the heat that we create and how we're going to extend the, the life of the tube 
is by using all three of these. Conduction, we're going to spread it out, not touching. We're going to conduct it, and we're going to thermally radiate it all the way around the x-ray tube. Okay? So it's going to look like this. Some of this and re redraw some of it. I'm going to draw two x ray tubes. One as if it is looking at you. Actually, I'm just going to draw the rotor. Or really, only the target of the rotor. So, what you're looking at right here is the, uh, the target disc of the x ray tube. That's the bolt that holds it in place. Now, when we make an exposure on that, uh, the exposure area at any given time is tiny. Okay, so all those electrons that travel across the tube are going to come from one area. They're going to be focused down on just one tiny little area, that disc. Okay, so where's the heat going to go? It's going to go all the way around. It's going to go all the way around it. Why? Because it's focused on that one area. It's focused on that one area, but what? It's spinning. It's, well, you're getting ahead of me. All right. <laughs> Yes, it's spinning, but even if it didn't spin, why is it going to move? Conduction. Uh, almost. Conduction. Conduction, right. Conduction is spread by touching, touching right. So it's all hitting right there, but that, all that's connected, so it's going to spread out. Okay? So if it spreads out, then it relieves some of the stress right here. Okay? So the heat doesn't stay right there. It spreads out. Okay? okay? So that's conduction. In addition to that, what we're going to do is we're going to take the anode and we're going to spin it around and around and around. And what that's going to do is it's going to change that point of impact. Instead of putting all that heat, depositing all that heat in one spot, it's going to spin it and change the point of impact so it's never focused in one spot. More efficient. Conduction. Conduction. Right. All right. So we got conduction. In the x-ray tube, we've got anode and cathode. So we've got two different ways, two other ways. That's all conduction there. We want to keep the, the heat there, right? We want to keep it off of the, the, uh, the bearings. So we want to keep it here. And for reasons we'll talk about later in the semester, the construction of that disk is going to be in a specific way to try to keep the heat off of these bearings. So we want to keep it there. We want to stop it from going there, okay? So we want conduction here, we want to end it there. So we've got conduction. What else do we have? We've got thermal radiation, right? So even if we create the heat here and deposit it there, is the glass going to get hot? Yes. Yes, ever touch an uh, incandescent light after it's been on for a while? Yeah. yeah. Is the filament touching the glass? It's still going to get hot. So we've got thermal radiation coming off of here and from here. Okay. So uh, we've got all the heat, but we've got to get rid of some of it. We spread it out and we thermally radiated it so that all the heat's not concentrated here and here. But inside of that big box, that tube housing, what we're going to fill that up with is oil. Okay. So you take something hot and you want to cool it down quick, what do you do? Put it in liquid. Put it in liquid, put it in water. Okay. Right? Might break it, but you know, it cools it down. Okay, so oil, a lot like water in a lot of different ways. It doesn't rust things though. Uh, it's lighter than, than water. And so uh, we're, we're gonna bathe it in oil. We're gonna put oil inside the housing uh, to cool it down. Okay, so now what we've got is we've got the glass in contact with the oil. So we dealt with conduction, we dealt with thermal radiation. Convection. Well, almost. We're almost to convection. But if it's touching the oil, what do we have? Conduction. Conduction. We got conduction again. So we're going to conduct the oil, or uh, <laughs> we're going to conduct the heat around the, the face of the, the anode. We're going to thermally radiate to the glass, and then we're going to conduct into the oil. And then what we're going to have is built into the housing, we're going to have a fan. Okay? This is not the fan that you might hear. Um, if, if you heard fan kick on inside the x-ray tube? No? 
It will eventually. We've got a light bulb inside the, the uh, collimator housing. All right, so we've got a light bulb situated over here that projects light so that uh, we can project a, a, uh, a light field that should correspond to the x-ray field, which is not going to be in this diagram. But at any rate, there's also a fan inside of here to, to keep all this cool. So this fan, you're not going to hear. And it kicks on periodically. And the purpose for that is to blow across the oil. So it's not situated inside of the oil, but it's situated inside of the housing. It's going to blow and it's going to suck air in and blow air out. And the air is going to pick up some of that heat in the process and it's going to take it out into the room. Sucks in cool air, blows out hot air, and what we have is convection. convection. Right. So these two we use to spread it out inside of the x-ray tube and from the x-ray tube to the oil, and then the oil is cooled by convection. And some of our tubes don't have an active uh, fan in it. It's more of a bellows system. So you heat up something, and what happens? Expands, right? So what happens is that, let's say we've, we've got this bellows system, and it's got a, a certain capacity of air, and, and if you haven't been using the room, and you've got all this air built up in here, you heat it up through a lot of exposures, and it goes up and heats up this air, but it also heats up the air here, and in, in the process, what happens is this bellows collapse, sucking air in and blowing it out. So it may, might not even be an active electric fan. It may be what we call a bellows type system. You know what a bellows is? It's a, you use to stoke up a firewood. That's bellows. So they may use that. So we use all three in order to pull the, the x-ray tube and extend the life of the x-ray tube. Okay. So we got uh, just a few more minutes. Uh, measures of uh, temperature. We got Celsius. We got uh, Fahrenheit, and even Kelvin. You know, there's uh, some other ones as well. Um, so you're not going to have to calculate truly uh, your your difference in, in temperatures. At this point, sooner or later, you'll have to. So if you want to play around with it, you can. Uh, you can go to different calculators online. You know, you can just type in uh, temperature conversion. You can kind of, kind of play around with it. But what you'll find in most cases, until you get uh, to really, really cold temperatures, uh, generally, um, the numbers in, uh, you know, if you, if you are calculating, and you confuse your, your two formulas for um, Celsius to uh, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to Celsius. If you're trying to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, let's see, and let's say you've got, I don't know, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, 20 degrees, well, first off, zero degrees Celsius is what? In Fahrenheit? 30. 32, 32, it's both freezing. So kind of carrying that on out, you know, 20 degrees Celsius is is, is going to be probably more or less than, than 20 degrees Fahrenheit. More, right. Okay, so you get, uh, you know, quite a bit more movement. 50 degrees Celsius will be more or less than, than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a lot more, right. What's 100 degrees Celsius? Huh? 100 degrees Celsius really hot. We, what, what can we do with 100 degrees Celsius? Boil water, right? What does it take to get to in Fahrenheit? 212. 212, right. So, you know, the, the numbers move a whole lot quicker. It's, it's between, let's say the two don't really match up until you get to, to a really cold number like uh, neg negative 40 degrees. Uh, so anyway, just be able to recognize a hotter temperature between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Okay, so radiologic units is the last thing that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> radiologic units, we deal with uh, a lot of fractional units. Um, a kilo, what is a kilo? Thousand. It's a thousand, right? So we use 
um, KVP is measured in, in thousands of volts, right? So KVP is thousands of volts. What is milli? It's one one thousand. So they're equal magnitude in the opposite direction. Okay, so you got one thousand is a kilo and one one thousand is uh, milli. So really we use milli a whole lot more than what we do uh, kilo, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. But uh, most of the time that we're, we're talking about uh, uh, kilograms or, or kilo anything, we're, we're talking about one of two things. Um, and that would be either weight equivalent um, or uh, KVP, right? But our, our dose rates that we're gonna talk about are often measured in uh, a number of different things. And most of those are gonna be, you know, minimum amounts are gonna be milli. So we have to have, in addition to all the other measures that we had before, we have some special measures that we use in radiology and in radiation exposure. And uh, we've got two different sets, two different sets. We've got a traditional set, and then we've got what we call a system international set. And a lot of what we still use uses the traditional set, okay? So what we've got in traditional is rad, rad, rim, Rankin, and curie, okay? So what a RAD is, the, uh, the first two are really acronyms. Acronyms are where you take the first letter of something or first two letters of something and you make a, a word out of multiple words. So what that stands for is radiation absorbed dose, okay? That being the key word. Okay, who gets the dose? The intentional dose. Or radiation? The patient. the patient, right. So the patient's who we're going to shoot. So this is going to be patient dose. Okay? That's uh, the, the, the dose, the actual amount of radiation the patient will receive. It's, it's not the same as your mass. Uh, there is a mass equivalent at 70 kbp. It seems like it's uh, 1 MR, MR per MAS. Okay? So uh, that is one milli rad per mass exposure at 70 kbp or something like that, okay? Don't take that as gospel, but that's something like that. So that's your patient dose. We also have to have an occupational dose. You're gonna get exposed. Uh, most of your dose comes off of the patient. So it's not the same quantity or quality of x-ray as, as what the patient's gonna receive bouncing off of the patient. So this is rad because of that. So it's a radiation absorbed dose equivalent man. Okay, so that's your dose is read in rims or milligrams. So whenever Trina takes your, your uh, film badge or your, your uh, TLD and sends it in and you get a dose, you know, you get a notification that you got a dose, what it's gonna be measured in is, is probably rim. Even though we moved away from that, it's still gonna be measured in rim, okay? Probably. So that's, that's and I'm, I'm gonna tell you what the equivalents are for each one of these here in a minute. And then Rinkin is exposure in air. So exposure in air would be like if, if they wanted to find out how how much radiation your x-ray tube was putting out at a specific dose, uh, as, as specific mass value, it's gonna measure up rankings, okay? So physics of your x-ray tube is here, your occupational dose is here, patient's dose is here, and this is not something that you're gonna deal with uh, as a measure of radioactivity, and that is gonna be in nuclear medicine. Okay, and they may actually just convert it to one of those other things. So uh, radioactivity, the curie, you're not gonna deal with all that much. So none of that is <laughs> in your textbook, but if you look um, under radiographic units, the first one you see is air current. Kinetic energy released <coughs> in matter. Okay, so 
What that is, is it's measured in gray, but it is air current, right? So if you notice, what it says is GY air. So it's measured in gray, and it'll be described as air kerma, but it is also referred to as gray. It's measured in the, the unit gray, okay? Now you flip over, what do you see next on page 22? Not the air kerma in the, in the ping one, but right under that you see absorbed dose. So what is that? GYT, which is, the T stands for tissue, the A stands for air. So it's the same measure, but it's, it changed its perspective. So it's in tissue, and it measures the absorbed dose, right? So your patient dose, again, is going to be gray as well. It's going to be gray, in this case, in tissue. And finally, on the other side uh, of that page, same page, what does it say? Effective dose, right, measured in, uh, it's pronounced Seaver. <laughs> so what does it say right after that? SP. SP, and then it says what? It's measure of? First quantity of radiation. Occupational dose, right? So both, both measures are identical, okay? So uh, really, they're all identical. Uh, one sievert equals one gray in tissue equals one gray in air equals one Rankin equals one rim equals one rat. So uh, when we're talking about x-rays, uh, we're talking about quality of, of the, uh, the radiation is all the same. Where it really differs is where we get to Curie, which is also the Becquerel, which is radiation, uh, uh, radioactivity, measure of radioactivity. Uh, it's touched on a couple of times saying that um, the, the type of radiation we use isn't nearly as uh, dangerous as the things like the, the nuclear meltdowns, Fukushima and, and all those. And here's why, because the radiation quality of each one of these measured in a comparative state between radioactivity and these as one, as opposed to these, the radiation quality, and that doesn't mean that it's good, that just means that uh, the, the amount of work that could be done or damage that could be done is totally different, and it is 20 times that. Okay, so radioactivity, bad, right? X-rays, could be bad. Not as bad as that, right? Okay, so any questions? No? That's the end of the chapter. Uh, everybody survived except that pen and my phone. Uh, that's uh, next Friday. Uh, Wednesday we'll pick up the chapter two. We'll just go ahead and start in chapter two on Wednesday. And uh, I'll have a test on Friday. I'm working on getting this uh, a single classroom that's big enough for everybody. Whether or not that's going to happen, I don't know. Uh, I'll, if it does, I'll, I'll let you know. And, and we'll probably either be upstairs or down in the south side room. Um, south side room is, is where you interviewed downstairs. Right? So everybody knows where that is. Um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. I hope we can get one and just do everybody at the same time instead of doing it in shifts. Okay? We'll sign a petition. Sign a petition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the people I talked to that the have emailed said that it, it might be workable. Um, you know, they, they've got to try to coordinate with everybody on campus. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a big process. I'll, I do not envy their job. Um...